some worship into this atmosphere. Let's worship the King of Kings.
privileges. Hallelujah. Let's sing hallelujah to the Lord. Ready? Praise our God, seek His 
What an awesome time of worship that was by our very own Faith Worship Center praise team. Now, whether you're joining us online or you're here live in the sanctuary, we want to thank you and tell you how delighted we are that you've chosen to join us today at Faith Worship Center. Now for some announcements. Today at 12 o'clock noon, you don't want to miss it. You want to be on the Faith Kids Facebook group and see the Faith Kids Sunday Sermon and see what Pastor Chris and his team has in store for all our kids today. Gather the family, get them around, and watch Faith Kids Sunday Sermon today at noon on the Faith Kids group. Unfortunately, this past Wednesday night, Reach Student Ministries had to postpone its worship under the stars. However, I've got great news. Along with this Wednesday's worship under the stars at 7 p.m., we'll be doing a Sunday night worship under the stars tonight at 7 p.m., and that's going to be in place of this past Wednesday's service that we had to move to Sunday due to inclement weather. So please make your plan, 6th through 12th graders, to be a part of Worship Under the Stars tonight at 7 p.m. Also, please make sure that you log on to the-fwc.church for all the church happenings and all the information concerning Faith Worship Center. And finally, thank you. Thank you so much for your continual giving during this time. Now, let's sit back and let's get ready for what God's going to say through Pastor Mark's message today. Good morning. That wasn't very good. I said good morning. Amen. It is so good to see you this morning. So good to have those that are joining us right here inside the service this morning, social distancing and doing all the things they're supposed to be doing. And it's good to have you joining with us this morning through live stream. We are glad you're here. This is an awesome Sunday. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this is the day that is 50 days past uh, Passover or Easter. And it's the day we celebrate in remembrance of the time the Holy Spirit was poured out on that first day of Pentecost following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So it's an exciting day. I am excited about being here this morning. I have looked with anticipation about being in this service today. Because understand something. Understand something. We're not waiting on the Holy Spirit to come again. He's already come. Amen? He came 2,000 years ago uh, on the day of Pentecost, just like Jesus said he would do and like he promised him. So we're not asking the Holy Spirit to come. He has come. But what we do ask him to do is to blow over us with a fresh wind of his presence. Amen? To let us experience what they experienced 2,000 years ago, fresh in our churches, on our lives, and every day. And that's what I'm believing for, and I hope you are too, that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to blow His fresh wind and fire across our lives and renew us, revive us, refill us, and restore us as we go forward. Man, i got some exciting things to share with you today. Once again, thank you for those joining us online this morning. You're a part of this. Let me encourage you, please, if you're joining us online, stay with us through the entire service today. At the end of the service this morning, I'm going to have a special time of prayer. As you know, there's a lot of things taking place in our nation, a lot of things that are happening. And I want to tell you something. The only solution is the power of prayer. I think it was last Sunday that I mentioned, uh, I made reference to the Holy Spirit or to the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters when the earth was in chaos in Genesis 1 verse 2. It says it was uninhabitable, it was out form and was void in darkness. But the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And out of the Spirit of God, God spoke into this existence and brought order. I want to tell you something. The power of the Holy Spirit can once again hover over the chaos we see today and bring order where the chaos is. Can I get an amen, amen from you today? Come on, and you out there watching online, y'all say amen so loud I can hear it all the way over here. Amen? That's what we've got to have. We've got to have a moving of the Spirit of God that will hover over the chaos that's taking place in our world today. And it's the only solution and it's the only hope. And it comes as we, the children of God, invoke that as we pray and as we seek the face of God. Well, again, so good to have you this morning. And I hope you'll stay with us. Uh, both here and there. When I say here, somebody said, Pastor, we got to stay here. We're here, but sometimes we check out in our minds. Amen? 
So don't do that. Uh, your, your physical body may be here, but your mind may be somewhere else. So let's keep it all in the right place today and hear what God is going to say. Well, we've been on a journey from the cross to Pentecost. We've been journeying all, ever since Easter, week after week, talking about the different events that took place between the time Christ rose from the dead and the day of Pentecost. And we've experienced some great things. The seaside fish fry, the first appearance of Christ to His disciples, many things that we've seen and walked through as we've gone through these last 40 days since uh, the time of, of the resurrection. But now we come to Pentecost Sunday. This morning we're going to explore a little bit about Pentecost. We're going to back up to start with to the very beginning of how Pentecost started and bring us up to how God used that to, to help a, an entire nation to see the power of the Holy Spirit poured out. We've been journeying to Pentecost, but this morning, Pentecost is here. And I want to tell you, it's not here this morning because we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday on this Sunday in 2020. The, the Pentecost is here because God sent the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago to empower the church, and He hasn't left yet. Somebody said, Brother Mark, I don't know about the Holy Spirit still being here uh, with, with all the stuff we see. Let me remind you what Jesus said in the book of John when He promised them. He said, I'm going to send you another comforter, and He will abide with you forever. Not that he will abide with you for a while. He'll abide with you forever. Can I tell you, even when the church was in a dark time, even when the church world went through the dark ages and went through a dark time, even though the church might have been in a dark time, the Holy Spirit had not left. And I don't care how dark things may look today. You understand the Holy Spirit is still here. And his power is still real and alive. And he is still willing and ready and able to empower us to be tools in the kingdom of God. Well, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. Then I want to begin sharing this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that Pentecost is here. Not just because we're celebrating today on Pentecost Sunday, but because 2,000 years ago, the promise you had made to your disciples was fulfilled when the Holy Ghost came and sat upon each of them like cloven tongues of the fire and empowered that early church to get about the Great Commission. That same Holy Ghost power is with us today to do the same thing, and that's to empower us to get about fulfilling the last great harvest. So, Father, help us today. Holy Spirit, anoint this your servant. Speak through me today as you have spoken to give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Back in the time that God brought his children out of Israel, God established what we know as feast times in the nation of Israel. One of the first things that God did as he brought them out of Egypt was he established feast days and celebration times that the children of Israel were to keep. And there was a reason why these feast days existed. They existed to be a continual reminder to the children of Israel about the things that God had done for them. There were markings, if you will, so that they would not forget what the Lord had done. Somebody said, well, that was unusual. Well, no, it's not. We do it today. We just had Memorial Day weekend, last weekend. What is that for? That's a marking in our history to remind us to not forget those who gave their life for our country. In just a few weeks, we'll celebrate the 4th of July. What is that for? That's a marking in our history that we regularly remember our independence and becoming a nation. We'll celebrate Veterans Day. We celebrate President's Day. We celebrate many things throughout our year as a nation as things that we do to mark certain times so that we don't forget and that we remember. This is what God did with the feast. You see, He created in Israel. They were times of marking so they would not forget what God had done and so they would remember it was Him that was where their blessing was going to come from. Not only did these feast days help them remember what God had done, God also used these feast days to help them prepare for what He was going to do in the future. 
If some of you have been here in times past, when, when we have laid out a, the Seder meal, the, that was the meal that took place during the Passover feast. We've laid out that Seder meal and the different elements of that meal. And you'll know that part of that element was to remind them about God's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. But that Seder meal also painted a perfect picture of the coming Redeemer, the Messiah. These things were in place for that purpose. One of the feasts God established, we know about Passover, that feast was established as they came out of Egypt. So what was Passover about? Passover was about redemption. It was about being redeemed from bondage and redeemed from sin. That's why Jesus Christ had to be crucified at Passover because just like that original Passover lamb when they were coming out of Egypt was their covering and their protection that caused them the next day to be come out of Egypt or to come out of sin or to be redeemed from a life of bondage, Jesus Christ came to be the lamb sacrifice slain for the foundation of the world to do what? To bring us out of Egypt, not physical Egypt, but the Egypt of our sins and the Egypt of our bondages that by His shed blood we are now redeemed. This is why Jesus had to be crucified at Passover. This is what Passover was about. Passover was about the redeeming blood to redeem them from bondage. That's what the blood of Jesus was about. It was about His blood redeeming us from a life of sin and bondage. So that's why He was crucified at Passover. But there was another feast that followed Passover. And it followed Passover 50 days later. In other words... What they would do is the day after Passover, they would count 49 days. So including Passover, that was 50 days to the feast of what was known by the Hebrews as the feast of first fruits, or the Hebrew name was Shavat. That was the feast of first fruits. Later on, it became known by the Greek word Pentecost. The word penta meaning 50, and the Greek word Pentecost means 50 days after. So we come to know that as Pentecost, but in the original, with the Hebrews, it was known as the Feast of First Fruits. What was it about? The Feast of First Fruits was about the children of Israel. It took place 50 days after Passover, and it was about the children of Israel bringing an offering to God as they would begin to plant their harvest to, to ask God to bless their harvest. I'm going somewhere with this, guys. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. It was a first fruit offering, a first fruit offering, realizing their dependence on God for their ensuing harvest. Realizing it was His blessing that would bring about a good harvest. So they would bring a first fruit offering and it took place 50 days after Passover. There was also a harvest that would follow the first fruit harvest and it was called the harvest of in gathering. And that was the harvest that at the end of their of their, uh, that was the uh, uh, feast that at the end of their harvest, they would bring an offering to God in thanksgiving for His blessing on their harvest. Now I'm going to talk about ingathering again just a little bit later on. So in Exodus chapter 23, if you got your Bibles, look there with me. Here's where God gives them the instructions. There's several other places in the Old Testament, but we're going to look at Exodus 23. And God gives them the instruction here about this harvest. And He said in Exodus 23, verse 15, He said, You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Bib, that you, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. The first feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was the Feast of Passover. That was where they would, 
they would have the Seder meal, the Passover meal, and then for seven days following that, they ate only unleavened bread because leaven represented sin, and Passover was a reminder they were coming out of sin, which again is exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. When He redeems us, He brings us out of a life of sin. Can somebody shout amen? And then, in verse 16, it says, And the feast of harvest, the firstfruits of your labors, which you sown in the field. This was now the first feast of firstfruits. This is what later on became known as Pentecost. And then, of course, the final thing was the feast of ingathering, which will be at the end of the year when you've gathered in the fruit of your labors from the fields. Now, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, here's what they did. They came out of Egypt at Passover. Passover was the thing that brought them out of Egypt's bondage. It was the blood of that lamb that protected them from the death angel. And it was the passing of that death angel that was the thing that broke the back of Pharaoh that caused them to be brought out of Egypt. So Passover now represents their redemption. They're being redeemed from sin. They make their way through the Red Sea, out into the wilderness... And they come to the mountain, which is known as the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. They come to the foot of that mountain. Now, I've been to Mount Sinai. I've been to the top of Mount Sinai. I expected to see thunder and lightning and clouds. Didn't quite happen that way. But it was a great experience, amen, to be there, the top of that mountain. I won't do it again. I'm not going to walk up a rough trail and dodge camels uh, three and a half miles and, and think my, take my life in my hands. It's a one-time deal, and it's good. Amen? I got the pictures, and I'll show you the pictures. Praise God. But it was a great experience. <clears throat> they came to the foot of the mountain, and there they were supposed to meet God. But it didn't quite work that way. What actually ended up happening was is that Moses ascended, and you got to remember this now, Moses ascended to the top of that mountain to get the law of God. So they come out of the wilderness, they come out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they get into the wilderness, they come to the foot of the mountain, and Moses now, the servant of God, ascends to the top of that mountain. What happens when he gets there? He ascends up the mountain, and while he's there, God writes his law on tablets of stone. you got to remember that. He ascends up the mountain, and God then writes his law on the tablets of stone. Forty days, Moses is there. When he comes down the mountain, it's time now to celebrate the first Pentecost. It's time now to celebrate this first feast of first fruits. It should have been a great time of celebration. Moses has been gone 40 days. They've been now 50 days in the wilderness since Passover. Moses is coming down with the law of God, one on one hand, one on the other, written in tablets of stone by the very finger of God. It should be a time of great celebration, but it wasn't. It was a time of great judgment. Because if you know the children of Israel and you know the story, you'll know that while Moses was gone, the children of Israel, rather than honing down the fort and doing what they were supposed to do, the Bible says they corrupted themselves. They began to involve themselves in all kind of, of promiscuous and lascivious acts. Even making a golden calf and stating that it was that that brought them out of Egypt. Moses comes down the mountain with the law of God in his hands, and he sees what is going on. In his anger, he throws the tablets down and breaks them. And then he says, who's on the Lord's side? Get over here. Those who didn't, he instructed the priests to slay them. And that day at the first Pentecost, there were 3,000 people who were slain. Because of their sin. If you know the story, you'll know that Moses now has to make a trek back to the top of Mount Sinai to get the law of God again. And again he does. 
3,000 slain at that first Pentecost or Shavuot or that first celebration of first fruits as they come out of the wilderness. Well, God made a promise. And understand, I want you to keep it in your mind about Moses bringing those laws down on tablets of stone. Very significant. God could not give them, listen to me, God could not give this people the law any other way except in tablets of stone. But understand, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was going to come a different way for God to deliver His law. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at verse 31, listen to what it says. He says, Behold, the days are coming. Here's a promise from God and a prophecy from the Lord. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But now listen to verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Are you hearing me, church? God was now making a promise that yes, I had to write those tablets in stone and you didn't even give me a chance to deliver them to you till you fell in sin. But listen to me, there's a day coming when I will no longer write my law in tablets of stone, but I will write my law in the hearts and minds of my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. And every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember no more. God is making a promise. Now I want you to think about this. At the first Pentecost, Moses ascends up to the mountain. Before the first Pentecost, after the church is born, Christ ascends into heaven. At the first Pentecost in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt, the law was given. At the first Pentecost, after the church is born by the blood of Jesus, the Spirit is given. At the first Pentecost, after they came out of Egypt, the law was written on tablets. But at the first Pentecost, after Jesus Christ has ascended and resurrected from the dead, the law is written on the tablet of their heart. Hallelujah. No more, God says, do I have to just write it in stone. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will write my word in the hearts and minds of my people through the power of the Spirit of God. I wish I could get just one amen in this house this morning. Amen. Mm, thank you. Hallelujah. Jesus had instructed them before he ascended. Do you see the correlation here? Do you see how these things work together, church? Do you see how God, even in the Old Testament through his feast, is painting a picture of what he's going to do in his New Testament church? Jesus instructed them they were to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he says, being assembled with, together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Do you remember me telling you, you nor I nor anyone else can accomplish anything in the kingdom without the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing is done. Nothing is done kingdom-wise without the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you may be listening online or even sitting in this house this morning and said, Pastor, I, don't, I ain't never heard about the Holy Spirit. 
Who is he? He is the third person of the Godhead. He's not an it. He's a him. He's a person. He is the one present with us. God's on the throne. Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And the Holy Spirit has come down. And He is the third person of the Godhead who is the agent that is here in this world to convict, to instruct, and to empower. If you get a word from God, you get it through the Holy Spirit. I think this is why it was so important that Jesus stressed we must be careful to offend Him or not to offend Him. If you offend the Holy Spirit, you've offended the very voice and ability for God to speak into your life. We must remember that. Well, in Acts chapter 2, <laughs> hallelujah. Some people don't like Acts chapter 2. Some people want to skip Acts chapter 2. How in the world can we skip Acts chapter 2? <laughs> How can we skip it? Well, it talks about tongues. It talks about tongues. Hallelujah. Why are we so afraid of that? Why is the tongues part such a division? It's in the Bible. You can't erase it. Who wants to erase it? Amen. It's a part of what God says. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, boom, just suddenly, God, send us a suddenly. Hallelujah. Send us a suddenly, Jesus. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues or cloven tongues as of fire and sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want to point out something to you this morning. There were two occurrences on the day of Pentecost, not just one. There were two. When, when the Bible talks about a day fully coming, it, it means when that day starts or when that day begins, when, that, when the sun is risen. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you see the sun begin to bring light into your day, you can say, okay, the day has come. You don't wake till noon and say, okay, the day finally got here, okay? No, the day comes when light begins to shine on that day. That's when the night is gone and the day has come. In the Bible, when it talks about the day fully coming, it means when the day dawned, when the day began. Do you understand these people had been in this upper room now for some seven days? Now, I don't know how that happened. I don't know if they went there seven days and didn't leave. I don't know if they came and went. I'm sure they had things to do and, 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 and whatever, that, that it would be hard for them to come and stay seven days without leaving. But what they did do was, and then Jesus didn't say go to a room and don't leave the room. He said go to Jerusalem and don't leave Jerusalem. Okay? What they had done, they found a place and they gathered there and they did not go any further from there until the promise came. I'm sure there were people that came and went. I'm sure there were people that, that had to go and take care of things at home. Maybe had a baby had to be fed or a cow had to be fed or whatever. But they didn't leave Jerusalem until the promise came. And I'm sure there had been people there all night long. And it appears that way here. It appears there had been people that had been in that room all night long. And at, at the time the morning dawns, there's about 120 of them that are there. Now remember, there were over 500 that witnessed Christ ascend, okay? Now that doesn't mean those other 380 were left out. 
They might not have been in the room right then, but if they were in Jerusalem, they eventually got included in what happened just like the 120 did. Y'all with me this morning? But at this moment, there were 120 or so that were still in that room that all, no doubt had been there all night that night. And when the day of Pentecost fully comes, in other words, when the sun rose on that day and the light came on that day, at that moment when that day came, the Holy Ghost invaded that room and the Spirit of God filled that place and cloven tongues so they could visibly see it set upon them and they began to speak in other languages. Well, understand something. There wasn't a crowd, or speaking tongues, I should say. I'll get to the languages in a second. There wasn't a crowd there then. You know, if we just slow down sometimes and really read Scripture as it says, we could, you know, we could really get understanding. And sometimes people don't. And this is where people misunderstand about what happened on the day of Pentecost. They say, well, that was a one-time experience just for that so they could speak in different languages. But that's not exactly the whole picture. When the day came, the Holy Ghost filled that room. And they began to speak in tongues right then. There wasn't a crowd there. There wasn't people gathered there. It was only the 120. Now, they're making some noise. Some people said, I like a quiet church. Well, I like it quiet too sometimes. Sometimes I need to make some noise. <laughs> Are you with me? Sometimes I need to make some noise. Sometimes a true Pentecost can get a little loud occasionally. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, y'all, hallelujah. Y'all, y'all with me. I know y'all are. Amen. Those out there watching. They were making noise. They were raising their voice. There was something happening. I imagine some of them had gone outside of that room, up and down the street, maybe. And their noise now got the attention of the people in the town as they're beginning to wake up. So much so that by 9 o'clock in the morning, about three hours after the sun come up, about three hours after the original invasion of the Holy Ghost has happened, they are now a crowd of people at about the third hour of the day, at about 9 o'clock in the morning, that have now gathered to see what in the world is going on in this room in Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost had been poured out when the day come. They're speaking in tongues that started when the day come, when they were filled. Now, three hours later at the night, at the, at the third hour of the day, about nine o'clock in the morning, people are now becoming to get, coming out of their houses, they're coming out of their businesses, they're saying, what's going on, what's happening, what's taking place? There's a noise down here. And they're gathering in the streets until a large crowd has gathered to, to, to look at this phenomenon that is taking place. It's not this time that under the divine supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, their tongues that they were speaking in originally turned into a supernatural ability to speak in languages that the people could understand. Boy, you're looking at me like a calf at a new gate. Glory to God. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Because God was doing exactly what Paul tells us in Timothy. He'll use the power of the Holy Spirit to do, to be a sign to those who do not believe. And they were hearing these people speak in their languages and said, how in the world can this be? These are just common people. They don't know all the different languages. Well, look, let's just, let me just read it to you here. Let me just read what you what they said on down in verse number 5. It says, They were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this, when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. No, no, the sound has occurred here. Now the multitude is starting together as the morning progresses. And we're confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in, what we were, in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, 
adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome and Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What ever could this mean? And do you understand that perplex, that perplexedness caught their attention and give Peter now the ability under the power of the Holy Spirit who he's just been filled with to stand up in their midst and begin to proclaim to them what was going on. These men are not drunk. Uh-uh. And I wonder what they were doing to make people think they were drunk. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll leave that alone. Hallelujah. These men are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. And on my servants and on my handmaids will I pour out my spirit, says the Lord. He quoted Joel to them. And he said, this is, this is not, these, it's just 9 o'clock. Well, the honky-tonk hasn't even opened yet. The, 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 the liquor store not even open. How can they be drunk? The bootlegger's not even up yet. He's still getting over his hangover from last night. Hallelujah. These men couldn't be drunk. No. This is what God prophesied about. That in the last days, I will pour my spirit out. And this is what you're experiencing here. This is what you're seeing here. Now, everybody that gets baptized in the Holy Ghost doesn't have fire set on their head. Everybody gets baptized in the Holy Ghost doesn't speak another language. What I want you to understand, though, is that God released something into His church. And do you understand something? Can I, can I just share something with you here? I haven't even thought about this until right now. How many of you remember the story about the Tower of Babel? Remember that? How that they were trying to build a tower to reach heaven? And whether they could have done that or not, I don't know. <laughs> But I do know that God looked down and said, I'm seeing man, and they are totally unified. And whatever now they set their mind to do, they can do. And can I tell you that unity can work both positively and negatively? You get people together on something, they can get something done, whether it's for good or bad. <laughs> unity is a powerful force. We need, this is something we need to learn in the body of Christ. If we could ever get unified together, my goodness gracious, we could literally turn the world upside down. If we all go in the same direction. And God came down, and what did He do? He confounded their languages so they could not understand what they were doing. I've had the ability to travel a little bit, and I want to tell you something language barriers are terrible. I tried to order in Mexican in Honduras, and I couldn't even make the girl understand my Mexican because she couldn't get it past my Alabama. When I spoke Mexican with my Alabama lingo, she still couldn't understand. I had to finally get our interpreter to tell her what the exact same thing I was saying. Language barriers are, they're, they're, they're tremendous barriers between people's lives. And what God did, God confounded their languages so that they couldn't carry out what it was they were planning to do, which was an evil plan. Do you know that every gift of the Spirit operated in the Old Testament except tongues. And it didn't operate fully. It only operated partially. God's prophets would be moved on, uh, the, the Spirit of God would, would move on them, not be in them. Remember that? Or you read that in the Bible? And we know that there were Old Testament prophets that would prophesy, the Old Testament prophets that had the, the gift of word of knowledge. You remember what they said about Isaiah? You know, every time they would go to the, the, the armies against them, every time they go to devise a plan, uh, then and, and they would be there and, and they would figure it out and somebody the, the, the king said somebody is spying they said no master it's like Isaiah is standing here in the middle of us <laughs> he knows everything we're doing <laughs> because the gift of word of knowledge was operating in his life God would give him that knowledge miracles worked in the Old Testament through a few as the spirit would move on them but not tongues tongues is the only gift we see that works exclusively in the New Testament. Now, understand, the gifts of the Spirit are given 
fully now to all who desire them or are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's, everyone is, is, is a subject to have a gift of the Spirit working through you. That wasn't in the Old Testament. It was only given to a few select people as the Spirit would move on them. But yet they moved, but with not tongues. So why? Why is this so important? Why is it so important that they were able to speak in tongues on, on that, that day when the Holy Spirit is poured out and everybody hear them speak in their own languages? I want to tell you something. Because God now has reunified what He has divided. You've been separated by your sin. I'm putting you back together by the power of the Spirit. I have heard stories. I've never witnessed it. But I've heard stories of people in foreign lands who would be praying and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they would begin to speak in a language. And they didn't know what they were saying. But other people could hear them speaking praises to God. Amen. God brought unity. Through this gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter stood now and he preaches to them. And because he's got their attention. And as Peter is preaching to them, he not only tells them about the pouring out of the Spirit, but he also tells them about the Christ that they crucified. And when he does, they are pricked in their hearts. And here's what happens in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Here's what I want us to understand this morning. The promise of the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of being empowered by the Spirit of God to do the works of God did not just belong to the early church. It belongs to every born-again child of God who will receive the power of the Spirit of God into their lives. It wasn't for a few. It wasn't just for the early church. No, this Holy Spirit power is for every born-again believer to be empowered for the work of the kingdom of God. Look at what happens now as Peter preaches to them and as they're pricked in their heart and convicted. In verse 41 of chapter 2, it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, wait a minute. Have we heard the, word, the term 3,000 before? Is there somewhere else we've heard the term 3,000? Wait a minute. At the first Pentecost in the wilderness, there were how many slain? 3,000. Now at the Pentecost, at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's how many born again? 3,000. Thousand. Do you see what God is doing? God, is, let me tell you something. God is such a God of order. God is such a God of perfection. You, you, you have to try to miss what God's doing. <laughs> you have to work hard to miss what God is doing. God said there were 3,000 lost at their rebellion, but I want you to know I have restored what's been lost by having 3,000 that are saved as I'm pouring out the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost. Everything that was lost by sin, I'm restoring by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. Help me out this morning. Everything that's been taken away because of the rebellion of mankind, I'm restoring through giving you the power of the Holy Ghost to live inside of you. Was it coincidence? There is no coincidence with God. You see, the Feast of Shavuot, or First Fruits, was about bringing first fruits as an offering to God for His blessing on an abundant harvest. Now, this is where I've got to slow down because you've got to get this. You've got to get this. The bringing of that first fruit offering, that, 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 that first fruit feast, that, that Feast of Shavuot that later on became known as the Feast of Pentecost because it took place 50 days after Passover. That feast was about bringing a first fruit offering. It was about bringing a first fruit and giving it to God so that there would be an abundant blessing on their harvest. Mm. Pentecost 
in Acts 2 is a first fruit offering to God that by the power of the Holy Spirit there may be anointing on the church that the church may bring forth a tremendous harvest for the kingdom of God. The first fruit offering in the wilderness was about their grain harvest. This first fruit of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was about an empowerment to both bring in a harvest, a harvest of wheat and grain, and now a harvest of souls into the kingdom of God. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was God's blessing on the church to assure His church that under the power of the Holy Spirit, they could have a tremendous harvest. Not a harvest of wheat and grain, but a harvest of souls. You see, the early church understood that. Those early disciples understood that. They understood the power of the Holy Spirit was now given to them for them to go forth and begin to gather the harvest. Because immediately, as they were filled with the Holy Ghost, as the power of the Spirit of God came to rest on them and live in them, they immediately went from that place. 3,000 people saved by one sermon. I sure would love to have a, a, a revival service like that. Praise God. 3,000 people saved just by Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And now they understood it's not for us just to sit here. It's not for us to just say, wow, what a great experience that was at Pentecost and talk about it for the next 40 years. No, we've now been empowered to go and gather the harvest. So from that point they left that place. They went in the power of the Holy Spirit and they went out to all the points of the world that was known to them at that time. Sometimes because of persecution, they would be scattered from one place to the other. But what did that do? That was like scattering coals of fire because everywhere that one of the embers went, a new fire would start. And as they were scattered across the region they would go to those places and what would they do hide no they'd begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ under the power of the Holy Ghost laying hands on the sick seeing the miraculous power of God and watching the glory and fire of God begin to spring up everywhere because they knew they were empowered and commissioned to go gather a harvest for the kingdom of God on Pentecost Sunday we celebrate the promise of the Holy Spirit given to every believer to empower the church to be a witness. The promise of a mighty harvest of souls as a result of the Holy Spirit resting on the church. Now, I told you that not only has God given us a first fruit blessing through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's also going to be a harvest, a feast of ingathering. You see, Pentecost is the feast of first fruits. The power to give us an abundant harvest. But there will also be a feast of ingathering. It's called the rapture or the catching away of the church. It's the final harvest. And at that time, we will, as the body of Christ, be able to present to God our presence. Of our in gathering offering, we'll be able to present to the Lord. Did you realize that? We've been given the feast of first fruits at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But when the church is called away, we'll stand before God, and before God, we will present the offering of in gathering. It will be a test or testimony to the body of Christ at how well we have done. And allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to use us to go out and gather in the harvest. The question is, will we have a big sheaf or a little one to present to the Lord? A big sheaf or a little one? How we've allowed the Holy Spirit to use us. How we've allowed Him to use us as tools to gather in the end time harvest is going to determine how big our end gathering offering be to the Lord and can I tell you something it doesn't matter how big it is compared to someone else's it only matters how big it is compared to what God has called you to do we need a fresh wind mm, 
We need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. We don't need him to come. He's here. Don't you ask him to come. That's like slapping him in the face. Say, what do you mean ask me to come? I've been here 2,000 years. I've been here since the beginning of all time. Don't insult him by asking him to come. He's here. So Jesus said, I'm going to send him. He'll never leave you. Ask him to re-empower us. Ask him to blow over us again. Ask him to let the wind of his presence renew us and revive us and, and blow fresh over our lives. And if you're listening today or sitting in this congregation and you've never been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, today as we close this service, I want you to ask God, say, Lord, I want to be filled with Holy Ghost power. I want to be empowered to do the work of the kingdom. I want to be empowered, God, to make a difference. And if you're born again by the blood of the Lamb, you're a candidate to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And to be given power. It's like, listen, listen, it's like supercharging your engine. Hmm? Everybody, anybody, anybody remember Chevette's? Anybody remember those little cars? I own three of them. Had a little four-cylinder motors in them. They were tough cars. But you didn't want to pull out in front of anybody unless you had plenty of room to get out of the way. But then I got a friend in Michigan, a good friend of mine, who builds cars. This past summer I got to drive his truck, 69 Chevrolet truck. It has a blown engine that has 760 horsepower. Now that's the thing is you want everybody else to get out of your way. Okay? Now you can live your Christian life with a Chevette engine. You can let God supercharge your engine and give you some extra horsepower. Come on now, church. You can live your life getting out of everybody's way, or you can live your life saying, get out of my way. Hallelujah. Come on now, church. And the difference is whether we allow the power of the Holy Spirit to fill our lives. I want to have a supercharged engine. Amen? Stand with me this morning all over this house. Ask Miss Kathy, just, just her alone, she'll come to the keyboard. If you're watching online this morning, if you want to stand in your house, stand or sit, whatever you want to do, but if you're watching online, I want to include you in this time of prayer we're going to have right now. And I want you right there where you are as we begin to pray in just a moment. I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to come into your house and come into your life. If you've never been baptized and filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, I want you to open your heart now and say, God, fill me. I want supercharged spiritual power in my life. And you allow Him to work in you. Allow Him to change you. And this morning, as we stand across this house, and, just, and, and, and we, we're going we're to start out for a few moments. If the Holy Spirit takes it over, we stay here all day, that's fine. But we're going to give him a few minutes to work in this house this morning and to blow over us with his fresh presence this morning. Some of you here haven't spoken in tongues in 40 years. It's time for God to renew the Spirit of God in your life. Amen? Let him have his way. Let him speak through you this morning. Let him pray through you this morning. Let him use you. Let him refill you this morning. Fresh and anew. Before we pray, we got problems in our nation today. You've watched the news this past week. You see the riots. I even understand there's a threat of some even in our own city. Police are not the, and I don't understand, but we need the police. And we, and we need to pray for them. But that's not the answer. The answer is the fresh wind of the Spirit of God. Last night in Minnesota, the Billy Graham Association sent people there. I was on a prayer call last night, and we were praying for them. The Billy Graham Association sent people there that are going to mesh in among those people. So we need to pray for their protection. We need to pray for God to use them and, and help them to be a tool to bring some order. Now, I want to tell you something. What happened to the young man by the policeman is reprehensible. If you've seen the video, it don't, I don't care what color somebody is, every, every life is important. Are you with me? Every life, I don't care what your color of skin is, every life is created by God and important to God. Amen. And what happened to that was absolutely re reprehensible. And the gentleman, or the person, I should say gentleman, the person that did that needs to be punished according to the legal system to whatever, however that can be done to the fullest extent of the law. Are you with me? 
Because taking a life is, is bad. I don't, no matter what. We understand that. But I want to tell you what's been unleashed in our nation the last few days has taken the light away from the atrocity that was committed. And we need to pray. We need to pray for order in our nation. Are you with me this morning? And not only this morning do I need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to blow over my life to help me in my walk with God, I need a wind of the Holy Spirit to blow over my nation to bring order to the chaos that the enemy has tried to create. Because there's people that have jumped on this thing for the purpose of, of trying to ex extend this chaos. And it's taken away from the very justice that needs to be done. We've got to pray. And the only answer is the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me this morning? Is everybody here? The power of the Holy Spirit to bring order in the midst of chaos. I need Him in my life. This morning, and those joining us online, I want us to begin to lift our voices right now to the Lord. And I want us just in this house to begin to cry out to God and to pray and to seek God and to open our hearts to the Lord. I want you to let the Holy Spirit pray through you this morning. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, just release Him and let Him pray through you today as, you, as He would will to pray through you. But I want us to enter into a time of intercession right now. For a few minutes, we're going to just get the Holy Spirit to have time to move both in this place and in the houses across that are listening to this broadcast today. We're going to ask God to bring justice. We're going to ask God to bring order. And we're going to ask God to send a wave of the Holy Spirit to flow over us again and renew us and refresh us and refill us that we can be the vessels God would have us to be. Will you join me in that this morning? Everybody in this house? Nobody's, we're socially distant, so nobody's listening to you pray. Amen? Let the Holy Ghost pray through you today. And let's see what the Spirit of God will do in this place. Father, we lift our hearts to you today, Jesus. Father, we cry out to you. Come on, church, pray. I need to hear some praying. Hallelujah. Father, we lift our voices to you this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask you to pray through us today. Speak through us today, Holy Spirit. Begin to move in the lives of those that are listening today. And Father, we ask that a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost will begin to blow over this house right now. Come on, church. Come on, pray. R raise your voice to the Lord. Those listening online right now, put everything outside of your mind right where you are. Come on, let me hear you. Let me hear you talking to Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, come. Holy Spirit, come. Wind of God blowing this house today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, come on, let's pray. I'm asking us to intercede today, church. I'm asking us to act like Pentecostals that we used to when everybody in the house prayed. Come on. Hallelujah. Father, we lift our voice today. We lift our voice to you today, Jesus. Father, those that are watching online, those hundreds that are watching online right now in their homes, Holy Spirit, come and invade their house right now. Come and invade their presence, Lord. Father, we lift up our nation today, God. For the heart is broken, God, over this gentleman's life that was lost, Mr. Floyd. And God, we want to thank you, God, for giving our legal system the ability to work and bring this injustice to a right. But God of heaven, we pray, God, for those now, God, that have tried to take advantage of this, God, to bring chaos. Take advantage of this situation, God, not because they care about the life that was lost, but because they care, God, about bringing chaos across this nation and causing destruction. Dear God! Dear God, move in these things, Lord. Move in these things, Jesus. We have a nation divided, Lord. And we need the Holy Spirit to move across this nation, God, like He moved across the face of the waters and brought order to the, to the, to the world. Father, we pray for our law enforcement. We pray, God, for our city right here in, in Gadsden, Alabama. And Father, we declare peace. And Father God, we declare unity, Father. We can declare unity among the races. Father, I want to thank you, God, that you've given us a level of unity in this city. And I come against anything that would try to disrupt or drive a wedge in the unity that you have brought in this city. As we've come together, black and white, working together for one goal. And I declare a war on the enemy that that will not be torn down. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit. Come on, church, let the wind of the Holy Ghost just blow over you fresh. Does anybody else besides me need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit? Does anybody besides me need a fresh Pentecost? <laughs> I need one. I need one. Come, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Spirit. Blow over us again with the wind of your power. Let us experience you like we never have before. 
If you watch it online today, right now, just soak in what God's doing in your house. Let Him touch you fresh today. Not just because it's Pentecost Sunday. You know, the Holy Ghost came 2,000 years ago. But because we need a fresh touch of His power. Blow over us, wind of the Spirit. Empower us again to bring in the last day harvest for the glory of your kingdom, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Can you just raise your hands one more time and right at home, wherever you are, and just welcome, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. Fill us fresh again. Fill us fresh again. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much. I thank you for the of your presence. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cannot make it without Holy Spirit power. If you're not walking where you need to walk with God, He hasn't left you. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's right there. If you're watching online today and you've never accepted Christ Jesus, right now where you are, just pray this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be born again. I want to be saved from my sin. Please, Jesus, come into my life and forgive my sin. And if you pray that and believe that, He'll wash you, cleanse you, make a new vessel out of you. Send us a message and let us know that it happened in your life. You give the Lord some praise in the house this morning. Bless you. Thank you for those watching us online. God bless you today. Join us throughout the week as we continue to do online Bible study, prayer times. We invite you to join us. God bless you today. Amen. Thank you so much for choosing to be a part of Faith Worship Center today. Now, before we go, I want to remind you of a couple things. If you missed any part of the service today that was streaming live on Facebook, you can go log on to the-fwc.church and catch the entire service on our website. So if you miss any of it, go check it out on our website. And finally, before we go, please make sure you gather the family together at noon today. Jump over to the Faith Kids Facebook group and tune in to what Pastor Chris and his team has to say today in the Faith Kids Sunday Sermon. We thank you so much for being with us today. We love you and we can't wait to see what God's going to do in your life.